We are live. Previously on Basketball Wives, changed by the back. So I have a friend from the. Sorry about that, folks. Hello, my name is Elizabeth Weiss. I'm the Federal Treasurer of Socialist Action, a member of the NDP Socialist Caucus Steering Committee and a past Secretary of the Toronto and York Region Labour Council. We acknowledge that we are hosting this event on Indigenous lands across Turtle Island, known as North America. That includes the unceded territory of the Mississaugas of the New Credit, the Wendat and the Audenoshani people in the place called Toronto. Today, I'm speaking to you from Montego Bay, Jamaica, where the Taino and Arawak-speaking people began arriving in Jamaica 4,000 years ago, but were wiped out by European colonial powers. We join in the fight for justice, recognizing that there can be no real reconciliation without restitution. That entails seizing the assets of the big resource corporations and returning them to the commons. Our title tonight is A People's Guide to Capitalism, an Introduction to Marxist, Marxist Econ Economics, featuring the book's author, Ades Thier, and discussant, Barry Wiseletter, Federal Secretary of Socialist Action Canada. Ades will speak for about 30 minutes. Barry will speak up to 10 minutes. Then we will take questions from the online audience. Audience members can submit a question by accessing the webcast directly from YouTube by putting the questions into the chat column. Please direct your questions if you wish to a specific person. If you like this webcast, please subscribe to the Socialist Action YouTube channel. If you agree what you're here during this program, please join Socialist Action by signing up at our website www.socialistaction.ca or by calling 647-986-1917. So let's begin. Adas Thier is the author of The People's Guide to Capitalism, an Introduction to Marxist Economics. It is one of the most soft titles published by Haymarket Books. She is a frequent contributor to Jacobin Magazine and is a member of the Democratic Socialists of America in Brooklyn, New York. Welcome, Adas. Thank you so much. Uh, it's great to get to be with all of you electronically, at least. Um, it's definitely the one kind of silver lining of this um, period that we're in, uh, the pandemic and a lot of electronic communication. So I, I get to be in discussion with people that I wouldn't necessarily normally get to meet. So um, it's great to be here, at least virtually with all of you. Um, this is quite a time to be alive. Uh, it's quite a time to be a socialist. Uh, I think the scale of the crisis that we're living through is unprecedented. Uh, we have this basically, you know, perfect storm of public health, economic, ecological, racial crises that are completely entangled and inseparable. And I think we're living through a very contradictory time. On the one hand, terrifying and bleak in terms of many of the things that are happening um, to us, uh, around us, uh, and in the world. Um, on the other hand, as somebody who's been an activist and a socialist for over 20 years, I think that there are some real opportunities for the left uh, that haven't existed in, in generations. And I think that also makes it a really important time to deepen our understanding um, of the system that we live in. And I think that's where Marxism comes in as a very useful tool. Uh, as Elizabeth mentioned, I, I wrote A People's Guide to Capitalism, a Marxist, uh, an introduction to Marxist economics. And the reason I wrote it is that I believe really strongly that questions of how our system works and therefore how the economy works uh, needs to be in the hands of regular people, right? It, we can't leave it up to the so-called experts. Uh, people like you and me have to be able to make demands, make changes, and ultimately overturn the way the economy works. And in order to do that, you have to be able to understand it, right? There's no other situation where you would willingly enter into a fight with an opponent that you don't know anything about. Uh, you want to know as much as possible 
uh, about what you're up against, um, you know, in a way that sports teams watch each other's games and learn each other's plays and strengths and weaknesses. Uh, obviously, we're not just up against another sports team and certainly not on a uh, level playing field, but that makes it all the more important uh, why we need to understand the system, what makes it tick, uh, its contradictions, uh, points of weaknesses, et cetera. And the assumption that the economy is too hard to understand, which I think is what uh, many people believe, really benefits the status quo because um, you know that leaves the system in place. And it's not a coincidence that we're told in a million different ways throughout our lives that trying to understand the economy just simply isn't up to us. And um, so that's, that's the reason that I wrote my book and that I'm committed to participating in as many of these kind of conversations uh, with other activists and socialists and people on the left as possible, because I think we are at this really important moment where everything in our society is being exposed, scrutinized and challenged. Uh, in the US where I'm based, you know, there are thousands of people flocking to socialist organizations. Uh, that hasn't happened in a long time. Uh, you know, there's a broader awareness in society about profits, who benefits at whose expense. You know, we're seeing billionaires increase their wealth by, you know, billions of dollars, astronomical amounts during a pandemic while millions of people are being plunged into poverty. Uh, and But we need to be able to go from this kind of broad uh, anger at the system, broad socialist instincts and aims that I think are resonating with increasing numbers of people and try to deepen and develop the kind of analysis uh, to understand the structures that we're up against. And in, in my view, Marxism is really the best tool to do that. So Marxism explains uh, capitalism as a system. It's not just a collection of individuals. Some are greedier or nastier than others, but it's a system with you know, a, a social structure that's made up of classes that have different material interests and operate based on those different material interests. Uh, now in my book, I go through some of the history about how it is that class society and specifically the capitalist form of class society arose. Uh, I don't have the time to get into that right now, although maybe we can uh, talk about that more in the discussion. But the main point that I wanna underline is that it's not just a natural human state of affairs that we are in this hierarchical uh, class society um, that is capitalism. But capitalism is, is really a historical moment, which uh, you know was created by human beings and could also be undone by human beings. Uh, in my book, I use the example of if you were to compact all of human history into a 24 hour period, then th there's really, uh, you know, capitalism is a, is a tiny part of that. It would take three minutes out of a full 24 hour period. It's, um, you know, that, that it's, a, it's a small segment of human history. Um, obviously it doesn't feel small when you're in the thick of it, but, but the point being that it's not that class hierarchies are built into our DNA, uh, but that the structures that we have in place are a product of historical conditions. They have a beginning and they can also have an end. Now, what makes capitalism capitalism? What makes it tick is a ceaseless growth of value. Marx defined capital as a self-expanding value. And I wanna unpack that just for a minute. Uh, basically, Marx described a basic circuit of capital through uh, a formula where he is a very basic formula, but it's M, which is money, turns into C, which is commodities. Uh, the money that capitalists start with is invested to produce commodities. And then out of that is M with a little doohickey next to it, technically called M prime, um, which is more money. The capitalist wants to end up with more money at the end of the process. Uh, and that's really the point of capitalism, right? Is the more money part. Uh, all of capitalism can really be summed up in those two words. It's to get more value out of the production process than was initially invested. Uh, the way that Marx put it is he said, it would be absurd and empty for capitalists to just engage in M to C to M, money to make commodities to get the same amount of money. Uh, if they were to just start out and then end up with the same amount of money, nobody would invest anything if that was the case. 
Uh, and, and actually that's exactly what happens in periods of economic crisis when it's clear to capitalists that they can't make a profit, then they just don't invest. The only thing that impels capitalists to invest their money is the prospect of making more money. Um, so, so what is value exactly? Under capitalism, it means a very specific thing. And it's not how actually valuable or useful something is to human beings. If we assigned values of, uh, to things under capitalism based on how actually useful they are, then you know things like water and bread would obviously be more valuable than diamonds. So what Marx did was he split the concept of value into two things, a commodity's use value, what you use it for, and its exchange value is what it exchanges for. So the use value of a chair is that you wanna sit in it, and its exchange value is how much does it exchange relative to other commodities? And in our society, obviously, that measurement is um, based on, on money. Money is, is used to measure that kind of value. So, um, and, I, and I will just pause to mention here that value in the way that Marx talked about value is not synonymous with price necessarily, even though value is kind of measured by money. Um, Marx was very clear that the way that prices get determined is a, is a little bit more complicated than, um, than just value. And we can, we can talk more about that um, in, in discussion. But the important point, point here is um, that there's a base value around which, um, you know, that each commodity is measured by. Even with price fluctuations, a chair is never going to cost more than a new car. And what determines that kind of base value, why isn't a chair ever going to be worth more than a car, is because a value is determined by um, you know, how much labor time goes into making it. And that's what is referred to as the labor theory of value. Uh, it's something that's attributed to Marx, but actually um, it was classical economists, people like Adam Smith and David Ricardo, um, most of the classical economists talked about the labor theory of value in some form or fashion uh, early on in you know, uh, capitalist e economic uh, history. That was a pretty commonplace idea. Marx developed that idea a lot more fully, um, but, but the, the essence of it is that the amount of labor time that it takes to produce something determines how valuable it is. Um, so an exchange value of a chair is determined by how long it takes to produce it, including how long it takes to produce the inputs for that chair, the finished wood, the machinery, and so on. So just in an oversimplified example, if it takes a thousand times as long to make a car as it does to make a chair, then a car will be roughly a thousand times more valuable than a chair. Like I said, actual prices are more complicated than that, but it's a good guide to understanding the basic driving force of value under capitalism. And the important part to draw out from here is that it's not something, value isn't naturally imbued in a commodity. It's not just that diamonds are really shiny and pretty and that's why they cost a lot of money. Uh, but value is socially determined by how much labor time is necessary to produce a commodity in a given place at a given time. So for example, computers in the 1970s were these huge clunky and not that powerful machines uh, they cost thousands of dollars to purchase because the technology just wasn't there to make them easily or quickly. Now we have the technology necessary to make much more powerful computers much more quickly. And so the value of computers reflects that. It is a lot faster to make computers. Um, and so it's a lot cheaper uh, to sell them uh, because less labor time has gone into it and less uh, you know, labor costs for the capitalists. So now you can get a computer that can do a lot more than the 1970s clunkers for like $300. Um, so the point of capitalism, for capitalists at least, uh, is to increase that value that they start with by producing more value, right? That's, that is to make a profit. And the standard conventional wisdom is that this profit is produced through the cunning of the market, right? Capitalists have a bright idea, a mission to Mars, a pretty iPhone, what have you, and they know how to market it, and they know how to buy cheap and sell dear, and they make some thrifty bucks in the process. Uh, and that's sort of the, the conventional wisdom of where profits come from. 
But the reality is that sure, there's some marketing genius involved in making iPhones more mark marketable than Androids uh, or, so on, or something like that. That doesn't explain why both companies are able to increase their wealth tremendously over time. And this is what Marx referred to as a seemingly magical goose of capitalism that lays golden eggs. And uh, fortunately for the capitalists and unfortunately for us, we are the magical goose of capitalism, our, our ability to labor, our labor power. So the extra, and, and I'll just say, step back for a minute to, sit, to talk about what I mean there, um, that extra value that comes out at the end of the production process, the M with a doohickey at the end, the more money, it doesn't come from the marketplace, but out of the production process itself. And the secret hidden within that production process, the magical goose of capitalism, is a special commodity under capitalism of labor power, our ability to work. So the ability to work, uh, like I said, it's become a commodity under capitalism. Capitalists buy it from us in exchange for a wage. So you could say that the exchange value of our labor power is measured in a wage. Uh, that's how much labor power is bought and sold for. But if the exchange value of labor power is a wage, the use value of labor power is very different. Just like the exchange value of a chair is how it trades, you know, how much it trades for on the marketplace. It's a use value is that you need to sit on it. Those are two very different things. The use value of our labor power is that labor is a creator of value. Um, you know, we talk what just what I, I mentioned a few minutes ago, the labor theory of value. What gives something value in the first place is how much labor time has gone into producing it. And the heart of understanding where profits come from is distinguishing between labor powers, exchange value, what gets paid to us in a wage, and the use value, the new value that we produce when we're at work. So typically a worker is paid one thing in wages, but then normally creates much more value during her work shift uh, for the capitalists. So, and the, and the, the essence of um, the problem for us and the solution for them, for the capitalists, is that we enter into an arrangement with the bosses where they own our time they own our ability to labor during that time. And, and what we produce for them, even if it's much more than what they've paid us in, in our wage, is theirs to keep. Uh, they pay us a wage, they own the products of our labor. So the example that I use in my book, just because it's a simple and clear cut example, is Starbucks. So let's say they pay you $120 for an eight hour shift, but you can make $120 worth of fancy coffee drinks in an hour or two. But you can't just throw down your towel after two hours and say, well, fair is fair. I've made back the money you paid me. You know, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm going home. Um, your labor is theirs for another six hours. The rest of your shift, you're basically working for free. And the extra value that's produced during this ne the next six hours, the stolen time, uh, which Marx called surplus, uh, surplus labor, is extra value that the bosses get to keep. Uh, surplus value, Marx calls it, and that's the basis of capitalist profits. So this arrangement brings us back to the concept that I mentioned in the very beginning, which is that capitalism is a social structure. It's made up of classes that have different material interests. We have one class, the capitalists, that because they own the stores and the machinery and the software and the capital needed to produce what Marx called the means of production, they can buy our labor power and put it to use to make more value for themselves. Um, and then we have another class that only really has one main commodity, which is uh, th that we can sell, which is our labor power. Uh, of course, you know, you can sell random stuff on eBay. Um, you might even be able to produce a few things on your own and sell it on Etsy or what have you. But those things are really negligible, um, kind of on the fringes of how the system produces the vast majority of goods and wealth in our society. So 
That's the basic Marxist definition of class, right? Anyone who holds economic control over the workplace, dictates the terms of others' working conditions, owns capital that can be invested in production, is part of the capitalist class, and anyone who has to sell their ability to work for a wage and has no access to the ability to produce our own life necessities for ourselves is part of the working class. And there's a middle class in between that I um, won't get into right now, though we can take it up in discussion, um, that's basically made up of managers and so on. But the main drivers of capitalism are basically bosses and workers. So we've talked a little bit about this kind of exploitative relationship between those two classes. Um, and you can see that these classes have opposite interests, right? One wants to squeeze as much value out of the other as possible. The other wants to have better working conditions, more breaks, less speed ups, uh, and, and a, to demand a greater share of what we've produced. Uh, but there's also an important relationship among capitalists that's important to draw out. And I'll just uh, spend a couple last minutes talking about that. Um, which is that, you know, so capitalists extract value from us in the workplace, but that doesn't mean that they automatically realize that profit by actually selling the goods that they've made. You know, so you can have Starbucks be being incredibly um, successful at exploiting us at the workplace, but they are at the same time, you know, in the US currently closing 400 stores this year because there are just less people going out to buy fancy coffee drinks. So the fact that they, the capitalists can uh, extract profit from us doesn't mean that they can then realize that profit unless they have willing buyers. So, um, so simultaneous to that battle taking place in the workplace around the terms of our exploitation is a battle between capitalists. If each capitalist had their own market, then all they would need to do is put their nifty magical goose that lays golden eggs to work and produce commodities, sell them on the market, and boom, they get profits. But the problem is that between each dash on this formula of the M to C to M with a doohickey uh, is a question mark for capitalists. If, if we made their goods in the production process, will the capitalists find buyers for those goods? And for this, they have to engage in a competitive struggle with other capitalists. Um, and this is where, to whatever extent there is a marketing genius, you know, that's, uh, you know, some of that comes into play there. But it still actually plays a relatively small part because the reality is that, you know, even in the case of, you know, iPhones, marketing gimmicks and so on, the reality is that, you know, companies like Samsung, which produce Android phones, have been able to produce them more cheaply. Uh, and that's gotten them a greater market share than Apple has. At a minimum, each company has to sell their items at or below the price that everyone is selling their items for. If most of your competitors are making 100 trinkets in an hour and you can make them in a half an hour, you're ahead of the game, your labor costs are down, you can sell them cheaper and you can undercut your competitors. But if the reverse is true, if everyone's making them in a half an hour and you're still using the old trinket making machinery that only produces 100 in an hour, then you'll be spending twice as much money on labor costs to produce the same amount of goods. And so you'll have to either charge more um, and then lose buyers or charge what everyone else is charging in order to keep you know, market share, but then operate at a loss. And either way, you'll be likely driven out of business. So this forces companies to produce as cheaply as possible. And they mostly do this by reducing the cost of labor um, through cutting wages and benefits, or by introducing labor saving technology, which means that workers are producing more goods in less time. Um, so the basic competitive imperative drives every capitalist to um, every decision making um, uh, process under capitalism. Companies need to make profits so that they can invest those profits in the most advanced technologies and then produce more goods faster and more efficiently. In the best case scenario, this can often drive technological innovation, but the ugly underside of this competition means workers being driven to continue to produce a profit at any cost. That means, you know, here in the United States, for instance, reopening meatpacking factories in completely unsafe conditions in the middle of a pandemic uh, or sending teachers back to work in uh, COVID 
petri dishes of schools basically because it, parents are needed uh, at their jobs to keep profits churning. Uh, so, so capitalism is a system that is primarily concerned with producing value, not in the sense of what's valuable to humans, but in the sense of what can be sold and for how much. And it's a system that produces that value through the exploitation of workers for the benefit of the bosses. And then it pits those bosses in a death match with each other to gain market share. Uh, and, and that's a death match that uh, uh, ultimately workers are made to pay the price for. Um, so that's sort of capitalism in, in a nutshell. Um, and and the, the good news, which maybe we can flesh out more in discussion, is that inherent to this profit system is also what Marx called the grave diggers of capitalism, uh, which is the working class. On the one hand, the vast majority of the world is working class and is therefore the victims of capitalism. But at the same time, uh, we also have a lot of power as workers, right? Profits make the system run. And when there's no profits, it makes the system stop. But where do these profits come from? Well, we generate them. And that's where our power lies. Uh, a lot of the, I don't know if the same kind of discussion is happening in Canada as in the US, but in, in the US, since the pandemic be began, there's all this talk of essential workers, right? The workers that are needed to make the system run. And that's essentially an admission of this fact that uh, the, the, the capitalism depends on the working class. Um, we'll leave aside for the moment the fact that uh, essential workers are basically treated as dispensable workers in terms of uh, how our lives are cared for. Um, but I think, um, you know, that fact of uh, working class power is, uh, I think, the important point that we can um, we can end on. Collectively organized into workplaces um, gives us the potential to organize that power. Um, so that's you know really a, the starting point for a, a discussion, and hopefully we can dig into the details of what all that means and how it relates to today. Uh, but I wanted to kind of provide the sort of ABCs. Um, nuts and bolts of, uh, of how capitalism works. Okay, thank you very much for this. Okay, our next panelist is Barry Wiseletter. He's a retired teacher, a union organizer, co-chair of NDP Socialist Caucus, and a member of the educational board of the SA newspaper and Turn Left magazine. He is the federal secretary of Socialist Action and League for Action Socialists. Welcome, Barry. Good evening, everyone. It's uh, truly a pleasure to participate in this discussion tonight with Hadass. I am a political organizer, a, a teacher of history, and a writer, not an economist. Still, I hope to uh, contribute something useful. I recall a story about Che Guevara in the early days of the Cuban Revolution. Fidel Castro called a meeting of the top leaders of the victorious July 26th movement. He asked them to take on various cabinet posts, including finance minister. He said, I need a good economist. And after a long silence, Che Guevara volunteered. Well, a week later, the cabinet met again, and Fidel asked Che for a report on the economic situation. Che said he had no report. Fidel said, but you promised to be our economist. Che responded, economist? I thought you said you wanted a good communist. Well, Che went on to be an excellent finance minister, uh, the national bank president, and he headed Cuba's sweeping agrarian land reform. So there may be some hope for non-specialists like me. <laughs> Hadass has performed a great service by explaining the nature and development of capitalism. The popularity of her book shows a growing appetite for as Marx wrote in 1845, not just to interpret the world, but to change it. The current triple crisis of capitalism, health pandemic, economic depression, and environmental catastrophe, demonstrates the need that the need for revolutionary change is more urgent and indispensable than ever. At the same time, it is crucial to know how humanity got into this situation and what we can do about it. It is essential for working people to recognize our allies in the struggle and to identify those who are not, to know which side we are on. 
To that end, an important indicator is growing social, is growing global inequality. According to the Credit Suisse Global Wealth Report, the richest 1%, those with more than $1 million, own 44% of the world's entire wealth. Their data also shows that adults with less than $10,000 in wealth make up 56.6% of the world's population, but hold less than 2% of global wealth. Individuals owning over $100,000 in assets make up less than 11% of the global population, but own 82.8% of global wealth. Credit Suisse defines wealth as the value of a household's financial assets plus real, real assets, uh, principally housing, minus their debts. Those with extreme wealth have often accumulated their fortunes on the backs of people around the world who work for poor wages and under dangerous conditions. According to Oxfam, the wealth divide between the global billionaires and the bottom half of humanity is steadily growing. Between 2009 and 2018, the number of billionaires it took to equal the wealth of the world's poorest 50% fell from 380 individuals to 26 individuals. Although the United States offers an extreme example, the situation in Canada is not dissimilar. David Thompson, Joseph Tsai, Galen Weston, James Irving, Irving and Jim Pattison are multi-billionaire anti-union bosses. The Irving and McCain empires run the province of New Brunswick, much like a feudal fiefdom. Many of the biggest corporations have prospered during the current pandemic, particularly in the retail, food, telecommunications, banking, and energy sectors. It's no exaggeration to say that giant pharmaceutical firms are making a killing in, in continuing the ugly legacy of unequal exchange between the global north and the global south. According to the head of global health at the World Economic Forum, of the 10, uh, sorry, of the 12 billion doses of anti-COVID vaccine Big Pharma will produce next year, about 9 billion shots have already been reserved by rich countries whose governments pay top premium prices. At the heart of this gross spectacle is a heartless system. It is anarchistic, irrational, undemocratic, toxic to nature, alienating to workers, and very, very violent. Capitalism persists in tormenting all who are touched by it. How does capital dominate? Well, the capitalist class rules by consent when possible and by force when necessary. It promotes its values through bourgeois political parties, mass media, schools, religious, cultural, and other institutions, all reinforced by the power of the state. The state plays a more visible and more repressive role when things appear to escape capitalist control. Until the time comes when the 0.1% are no longer able to impose their control. The capitalist imperialist system is characterized by cycles of economic boom and bust. Each downturn displaces millions of workers, fueling racism, sexism, misery, and war around the world. The business cycles are actuated by the chaotic nature of production under private ownership, which is anything but a free enterprise for the vast majority of humankind. Overproduction results in a glut of often useless and utterly wasteful things, to say nothing of how the externalization of the outflows of capitalist industry has a devastating impact on nature. Overaccumulation, the amassing of super profits with no profitable outlet in commodity production leads to investment in cash and derivative instruments, speculation in real estate, currencies, stocks, bonds, commodity futures, interest rates, and market indexes. This is called financialization of the economy. Financialization starves the working class of the things that we need, like good housing, schools, healthcare, and sustainable energy, while inflating the wealth of the mega rich. To encourage consumers to spend money they do not possess, retailers provide easy credit. So there is phenomenal debt, a huge mountain of debt, until the debt bubble bursts, revealing another great recession. Actually, it would be called the Great Depression if not for a permanent and massive war production industry. One of the great contradictions of late capitalism concerns the growing reliance of the capitalist on machines. 
Machines can raise productivity and liberate workers from the drudgery of arduous and dangerous work. But in the mode of production where profit is derived from the exploitation of labor, a growing reliance on machines, including robots, spells doom for capital. It is possible to squeeze a worker to produce more and faster, up to a point, of course, but a machine has a fixed limit and a constant cost. It is not negotiable and it is costly to replace. The great Marxist economist, Ernest Mandel wrote in his introduction to Marxist economic theory, and I quote, do all capitalists progressively add machines, increase their constant capital and the organic composition of their capital? No, the increase in the organic composition of capital takes place antagonistically by way of a competitive struggle governed by that law which the great Flemish painter, Peter Bruegel, portrayed in an engraving, the big fish eat the little. This raises a question. In terms of the rise in the organic composition of capital, do the fixed costs of machinery make a decline in the average rate of profit unavoidable, leading to ever deeper crises? I'd like to know what Hadass uh, thinks of this formulation. In a rational, democratically planned economy, new technology would be deployed at the service of the working class and hence of humanity as a whole. It would be possible to radically shorten the work week it would be possible to massively improve health and safety and raise the quality of life for everyone. Mandel wrote, and I quote again, the factor of periodic economic crises is inherent in the capitalist system and remains insurmountable. This remains equally true, even if current crises are now called recessions. Crises are the clearest manifestation of the fundamental contradiction in the system and a periodic reminder that it is condemned to die sooner or later. But it will never die automatically. It will always be necessary to give it a conscious little push to affect its demise. And it is our job, the job of the working class movement, to do the pushing." Close quote. Of course, to achieve the goals associated with a rational, democratically planned economy, it will be necessary for the working class to make a socialist revolution in every country, at least in the biggest nations on earth. But how? Marx taught that the working class is destined to be not only a class in itself, but a class for itself. Marx insisted that for workers' interests to advance, it requires a political self-organization independent of the capitalist class and independent of its parties, its institutions, and the state. Socialist action sees the need to build a mass revolutionary working class party. A transitional step in that direction is the effort to build a labor party in the United States of America and to wage the fight for socialist policies in the labor-based New Democratic Party in Canada, as well as in the unions and other workers' organizations. That excludes any support, even indirect support, for capitalist parties like the Liberal Party in Canada and the Democratic Party in the United States. The working class must build its own party and fight for socialist transformation of society. Moreover, as socialism in one country alone is impossible, we see the need to build an international revolutionary workers' party now. We warmly welcome everyone who agrees with this idea to join us in socialist action. Thanks very much. I look forward to the discussion. Thank you, Barry. So now we will go to our producer, Kurt Young. Here's some questions from our online audience. Hello, so I'm gonna start with our uh, first question comes from Julius and he asks, some people assume that capitalism is synonymous with the existence of markets. They assume socialism results in poverty. How do we change that narrative and convince people that socialism means humanity reaching our full potential? JPL asks, can you give some examples of real capitalist contradictions and the way of not showing them as contradictions? And then finally, Mitchell Shore asks, I'm interested in thoughts on the role of race and gender within the history of capitalism and how works uh, today, especially when we see how people like Biden are creating a diverse cabinet. 
Okay, so we have the three questions. We will go to our panelists. We will start with Barry and then Ades. And you have up, each have up to eight minutes to answer uh, whichever questions you want to, all three or whatever. So Barry. Barry, you're muted. There we go. <laughs> I didn't mute myself. <laughs> it was magic <laughs> or the gremlin, the capitalist gremlin in, in the machine. So Julius asks about markets and capitalism uh, as opposed to um, implying freedom and socialism and poverty. So there are a number of uh, issues bound up in this, in this question. Uh, first of all, uh, the existence of, of markets do not necessarily reflect um, uh, a competition of equals. Uh, we, we have at least since um, the beginning of the 20th century, monopoly capitalism, with the rise in the epoch of imperialism. Uh, the, the big fish eat the little. Uh, giant corporations dominate a whole field, a whole economic sector, um, by eliminating the competition that threatens their, their super profits. They'll even uh, uh, sell low in order to capture market, wipe out the competition, and then raise their profits when they have a monopoly or an oligopoly if they can make a deal with two or three other large capitalists in, in the sector. So markets are anything but free. And if we remind ourselves about any number of the scandals that we've seen uh, over the decades, uh, for example, um, uh, Volvo uh, promised to produce a, a vehicle that would have less um, carbon um, impact on the environment. Um, and they marketed their, their, their vehicle uh, with, with that promise, but it turns out they were lying and they could get away with the lie only for so long. They got away with it for any length of time at all simply because they were a big player in the market. Uh, but this was not in the interest of, of health and was not in the interest of truth, <laughs> to say the least. Uh, socialism and poverty, well, uh, the, the, there are different measures of, of, of poverty. Uh, most people will uh, uh, be satisfied if they have uh, um, uh, a good roof over their head, uh, food on the table, uh, education, health care at a, at, a, at, a, at a high standard. And that's, for example, what you have in, in, um, in Cuba. Uh, Cuba suffered 500 years of colonialism, but it offers the, perhaps one of the best health care systems uh, in the world. Uh, Cuban children don't beg on the street. Uh, they, they have a good health care system. Um, and this is a social good. Um, uh, but the, the, the fact that most Cubans don't have uh, bank accounts bulging with gold and money uh, doesn't mean they don't have a, a, a standard of living which is superior to most of humanity in the less developed countries at least. And again, remember that Cuba uh, made a revolution on the, um, uh, on, 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 in the aftermath of centuries of colonial exploitation. So how do you measure poverty? Uh, poverty in, in human values rather than in uh, the ability to accumulate personally um, uh, a great amount of, of, of wealth at the expense of your neighbor. Uh, so th th there are different ways of calibrating uh, social goods. And that's what we need to uh, explain to people in order to help more of our coworkers understand that when we pool our resources and when we extract <laughs> from the profits of the big corporations, we can have a healthcare, a universal, single-payer healthcare system for the benefit of everyone. And when we demand a Green New Deal that, that puts public ownership um, in, 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 in command of the resources, uh, the productive resources of society, we will be able to sustain civilization. There are no jobs below 10 meters of water. Uh, rising sea levels make this uh, an urgent, urgent matter. Um, I think I'll leave it at that. And um, I'll let uh, Hadass take up the, that and the other questions. Thanks. Okay, great. Can I, should I jump in? Yes, of course. Go ahead. Okay, great. Um, yeah, these are great questions. Um, I guess I will start by saying, you know, I agree with Barry about markets. Um, I think the, again, the conventional wisdom that's, be, that's put forward um, by kind of mainstream media and uh, the sort of talking heads of capitalism is that markets bring democracy and good. And uh, at 
at, at worst, even if there's some, you know, uh, sense that a lot of uh, the, the worst aspects of capitalism aren't democratic, um, you know, that, that the spread of capitalism uh, requires wars and imperialism, uh, et cetera, even if there's an admission of that, there's a basic assumption that, well, at, at the very least, markets can get us what we need, right? Uh, that's what they're built to do. And I think that the pandemic has exposed uh, the extent to which this is absolutely not true. So we have, um, you know, uh, in, the, in the United States, for instance, um, states were bidding against each other for masks and for ventilators. Uh, instead of those goods being just produced in mass quantities, distributed centrally, um, there was bidding wars. You know, masks cost eight times as much as they usually do um, because that's how much money could be gotten for them. You know, and that's uh, that's capitalism working well from the perspective of capitalists. Um, you know, right now, I think Barry had mentioned the issue of vaccines earlier. You know, this is the this is the market at play. Uh, it's a monopoly uh, type of market, and because basically, the patent system ensures that each company can create its own monopolistic fiefdom because it controls the patents, it controls the technological and scientific know-how to create those vaccines. This is just absolutely horrifying and barbaric to think about that in the midst of a pandemic, there's more, it's more important that Pfizer's profits and Moderna's profits are upheld through a patent system and making sure that other companies don't, you know, uh, encroach on their ability to make these vaccines um, rather than just saying, okay, they're on to something. Now let's get that information out as widely as possible and get these vaccines produced uh, in the quantities that we need them and distributed freely around the world. Um, to me, that's the essence of what socialism and democratically controlled and planned economies uh, could do. You know, in the midst of a pandemic, instead of trying to just reopen economies as quickly as possible because businesses are losing revenue, that you would shut down economies for as long as it takes, that you would pay people to stay home for as long as it takes, uh, and then you would funnel resources into vaccine development, into production of masks and ventilators, uh, and taking care of um, the, the actually essential workers in the most minimal sense, um, keeping as many people as home as possible uh, and making sure that the people that, that have to go to work in order to get food to people and get, you know, um, and, and have medical care, et cetera, are being cared for. Um, so to me, that's the, that's the promise of socialism. Now the, the word socialism has been distorted historically um, by various countries that were not True, you know that that we're not truly democratically um, uh, mass. Uh, that we're not based on mass democratic um, equality, which I think is what uh, real socialism is about, and um, and that's why I think the um, you know the assumption that socialism equals poverty or equals you know the gulags in the Soviet Union, etc. Um, I think is comes from and it's understandable, but I think we have to um, actually separate out the instances where the word socialism was used, um, but not necessarily because there was socialism in place uh, in the same way that capitalism may use the word democracy, um, even uh, though we don't really live in a democratically uh, uh, run uh, society. Um, in terms of some uh, capitalist contradictions, um, there's there's a lot, and maybe I don't know that I'll have time to go through it right now. But I'll start, and maybe we'll have time to talk more about it. As you have time, go ahead. Okay, great. Um, you know, I think th one of the contradictions that kind of that Marx talks about, and that a lot of other contradictions flow from, 
is what I refer to in the beginning of my presentation about the difference between a use value and an exchange value. Um, that every commodity has what it's useful for and then what it exchanges for. And that capitalism only cares about the exchange value. And, um, and that leads to a lot of problems, uh, certainly a lot of problems for, for us, for the majority of, of humanity, when the price and profits of vaccines are more important than um, the use and distribution of vaccines, for instance. You know, but, you, but it's also a problem for capitalists, to be honest, because um, it's, it's, that's a challenging system to, to manage and to maintain profitability with. So if you think about something like the housing market, um, you know, why is there a housing market? <laughs> so housing, if it was just about housing people, um, would be, um, you know, something that would be not that difficult to figure out how to, um, how to plan and develop, right? You would figure out how many people need housing, where, and then you would, and then you need to figure out how to marshal the resources and the labor to, to create that housing for the people that need it. Uh, or in many cases, we have an abundance of housing. You know, we have extra extra housing that's not in use, despite the fact that there are people that don't have a place to live. So these aren't, you know, they wouldn't be small inconsequential challenges. We would have to, we would have to, you know, put some effort into, um, into figuring that out. Um, we would need to, we would need, you know, some technology and communication and so on and so forth. Uh, but it's not an impossible question to figure out. It's pretty straightforward. However, if you have a housing market that is really just concerned with who, you know, what is, as capitalists call it, effective demand. Effective demand is not just who needs housing, but who can pay for housing and how much. Um, and then you have a much more complicated problem, which is that, you know, the houses get produced in order to uh, make a profit. And, um, you know, in, if you look back 10 years ago at the Great Recession, it was a, a housing boom um, that eventually popped um, that helped to set off the Great Recession. Um, and that's because, you know, the, the expansion of production um, isn't aligned with actual demand and needs. Uh, it's aligned with profitability. Um, and so we were in a situation where, you know, basically prices kept going up and up and that made it more and more um, profitable to invest in. Um, housing mortgages were then used by financial capital, spliced up in order to buy and sell the actual debt associated with mortgages. And all that was great for the capitalists, um, you know, so long as that kept going um, and a lot of debt was used to finance those mortgages. Uh, but once the mortgage payments started to become unaffordable, um, you know, that ran up against a real limit and the housing market popped. Um, so that's just one example, but it's just to say that the sort of difference between making things for people to use versus making things in order to sell profitably uh, run up against each other um, and, and um, create a lot of um, contradictions and crises within the system. There's, uh, there's more, more that could be said there and more examples. Uh, but I want to, if I have one minute. Um, yeah, just, you have one minute. Okay, great. Um, just to touch on the question of race and gender and the history of capitalism, you know, that's a huge topic, obviously. So um, that could be its, its whole other, um, a whole other talk. Uh, and, and that would be really good. The, the one thing I would say, right, is that, um, you know, it's in, in the case of the Biden administration, for instance, it's a very low bar to say that having a certain amount of diversity is what will get us liberation because capitalism, race and gender are completely inextricably linked to exploitation, right? Capitalism depends on oppression it depends on uh, racist oppression, it depends on sexist oppression and a whole host of other oppressions. And each one is the top, should be the topic of its own talk. They have different histories and different ways that they operate, um, but they are absolutely central to like 
keeping the status quo in place and keeping capitalism able to tick. Now, Biden, you know, filled his communications team with women, for instance, but the, that's a very low bar for what women's liberation means, because actually the fact that there are, you know, women in his communications team doesn't tell you anything about what they will actually be communicating. What is the the substance of Biden's policies? Because ultimately, if you want to confront um, sexism, if you want to talk about women's liberation, you need to talk about things like universal health care. You need to talk about uh, paying people, um, you know, extending uh, uh, economic relief and paying people to stay home. You need to talk about public universal ch child care. Um, you need to talk about, you know, stopping wars and droning people um, uh, around the world if you want to talk about protecting women around the world. These are the actual policies that are necessary to um, to to take to to move forward with uh, women's liberation more so than you know the spe specific diversity of, of of Biden's cabinet. That's not to say that I'm against having diversity on the cabinet, um, because you know sh do we want more representation? Sure, but we need to go a lot further than that if we're going to actually uh, make an impact on um, on sexism and racism. Um, and, and the other uh, kind of critical oppressions uh, that capitalism uh, depends on to, to run. Okay, thank you, Edas. Okay, so we're gonna go back to our producer now for more questions. Uh, so Kurt, I think you said we have four. Hello, Kurt. Yes, I did. Do you want me to answer all four questions at once? Yeah, you can ask all four. Put the four in the chat, and, and then I will go back and tell the panelists the time. Okay. Oh, uh, so, oh, that did not come out properly. Okay. So, um, question is, Start, the first question comes from myself and I ask, the capitalists uh, using their endless profits in order to buy out politicians show that capitalists are very aware of class warfare. What can we do as socialists to illustrate that fact? Uh, next question comes from Roy Jones. Do the panelists agree that the capitalist press and educational system taught incorrectly that in the communist systems, workers suffered, had no free speech, were oppressed, etc. And then uh, next question comes from Julius. How did socialists grapple with the issue of production of goods and limiting the exploitation of the environment? Will it be possible to provide luxury space communism with stuff destroying the planet? And I have a last question from myself and I ask, Capitalism has proven over the generations that it will do anything to secure profits and thus is not willing to subject itself to the loss of profits due to competition. Has capitalism ever adhered to the portrayal that has been stated? Okay, so we'll go back to our panel and we will start with Adas and then Barry and you have up to nine minutes to answer uh, whatever questions you, you want from the four uh, presented. Das? Okay, great, thank you. Um, let's see where to begin. There's a, a lot of good questions. Um, hmm, I, I guess I'll start with a question of um, that Julius asked about how socialists grapple with production and the exploitation of the environment. I think that that's a really central question, um, and and more and more so as we you know descend down the path of ecological ruin, basically. Um, you know, I think the, the first thing to say is that there's a number of, you know, that the, the way that, it, that things are, are painted around consumption um, and the assumptions that people make about that is that we're all sort of equally guilty um, or at least similarly guilty, if not completely equally. Um, and, you know, to this, you know, problem of consumption that, and, and uh, the limited resources of our planet. Um, 
Now, I do think that capitalism promotes, you know, a very warped um, ethos of consumption, for sure. Um, but I also think it's important to say that the vast majority of, um, of waste and of um, carbon dioxide emissions and so on come straight from the capitalist class. The number one emitter of carbon dioxide in the world is the Pentagon in the United States. Um, and there are certain things that if, you know, if we were to get to a, a different kind of, you know, uh, society, a socialist society, um, you know, or, or, you know, we're able to, to make major changes, um, you know, the first thing we would do is get rid of the Pentagon. Um, and that would be a huge blow uh, to, to climate change. Um, I, you know, there are other industries incredibly wasteful. I mean, the entire advertising industry, you know, just get rid of it. Um, um, you know, plastics, incredibly um, uh, damaging to the planet. I think those would have to be phased out. That would be harder to eradicate, you know, than on a dime um, than, than, the, than the military. But, um, but that I think could, could be eradicated. And, and things like, you know, transportation, you know, cars are obviously a, a huge problem and um, the, the world is, is packed full of them, but you need an alternative, right? You need, you need a public transportation system, you need trains. Um, you know, where I live in New York City, there's still too many cars, um, but actually most people don't have cars because we have a very um, underfunded, but still uh, effective subway system. Um, so there's there's kind of big picture changes that need to happen that I think would make a huge difference. Um, you know, public transportation, um, getting rid of the military, um, these kind of things would uh, would I think drastically uh, change the course of of, of things uh, if we were to to be able to make those changes. Um, now there's a lot of debates within the Marxist movement about the question of growth versus degrowth. And I think, I'm not gonna get into it fully, but I will just say that, um, you know, it's not realistic to kind of go back into small scale cooperatives and communes and so on, uh, because we have a global population and we have the technology um, where we could actually feed and clothe and shelter the entire world over um, if that um, if if we were to take over that the means to do that in an econo in a in a democratic way um, so so I, I don't think it's it's um, um, I don't think it's possible to like go backwards but I do think that we would want to limit, you know, how that growth happens and make sure that it's done in a sustainable way. And I think, you know, there's a lot that could be said about that. You know, there's a lot that people have studied around, um, you know, obviously renewable resources, the way that agriculture is organized, um, multi-crop versus single crop. I mean, a whole host of things that kind of flow from that. But I think it's absolutely possible to organize things in a way that is, um, that is sustainable um, and that can actually, um, you know, use the technology and technological know-how that we have uh, towards good as opposed to towards short-term profits. Um, so, you know, what else can we say here about some of these questions? Um, I, I absolutely agree that, you know, the capitalists are very aware of class warfare and they, they are also wield it very effectively, right? They have a system that very much um, benefits them and they, and they know how to use it. Um, I think that, um, I think that that is being, regardless of what socialists do and don't do, I think that is being exposed very clearly um, and, and more and more. I mean, Again, I can speak more to the U.S. experience, but um, I'm sure there are similar things, um, similar examples in Canada. Um, but you know, in the United States, uh, politicians of both parties are 
incredibly unpopular. I mean, the, the popularity of uh, Congress was like 18% of both parties in Congress. Um, you know, people understand, we have this whole debate right now happening in the United States Congress about continuing economic relief. There was a set of bills in the spring that basically helped to keep millions of people afloat through uh, enhanced unemployment benefits and through, um, you know, direct checks. Um, it was, it could have been much better, but it was uh, something at least. Um, and it did really keep people afloat. Those things started to expire over the summer and haven't been renewed since. And there's ongoing debates and there's a debate going on right now about whether to extend uh, economic relief and how much and et cetera. Um, and, you know, most of the, of the people in Congress themselves are millionaires, you know, so they're having these, these debates about whether $1,200 per person is too much, you know, and versus $600. The, we, we received one check in the United States for $1,200 back in the spring, and that is supposed to last us through the pandemic. So I think that the, the capitalists have, have been exposed um, and uh, are continuing to expose themselves in terms of being uh, very aware of class warfare. I think the bigger challenge for us um, beyond awareness is how do we organize our side? And um, I know I'm at time, so I'll, I, I, um, I, I, I will stop there. But I think that, that that's sort of like the million dollar question is about how do we take the next steps to actually um, continue to organize our side? And obviously there's a lot of answers within that and a lot of strategies um, that we can talk about, but I'll, I'll, I'll stop there for now. Okay, thank you, Barry. Yes, uh, so many questions and so little time. Uh, so uh, I, want, I want to tackle one of the questions that, that was posed in the first round that I didn't uh, uh, address, and that was from Mitchell concerning uh, race and, uh, and diversity in the, the upper echelons of government. It's window dressing. And unfortunately, uh, people who don't um, have the time to think uh, long and hard about how uh, the system works to their disadvantage might be momentarily or occasionally impressed by appointments. Uh, there are some uh, Canadians uh, who think that Justin Trudeau is a feminist, even though he can't um, keep any of his promises with respect to clean drinking water in indigenous communities or um, you know, uh, providing a national child care program, which has been promised by liberals for the last 30 years. Uh, or implementing proportional representation, which would improve uh, representative democracy a little bit, at least, in the Canadian parliamentary system, although it's certainly not a panacea. So um, purporting to address race by putting um, body cameras on cops uh, is, is, is worse than a superficial uh, a solution to a deep-seated problem. Uh, uh, we, we need to expose these one by one. We need to say that, well, if you're, if you're really a feminist, then why don't you raise the wages of women to um, uh, equal pay for uh, equal work? Uh, uh, wh why not provide a national child care program so that um, both parents, particularly women who bear uh, a heavier burden in the, in the household, can um, pursue education and career um, while... Uh, uh, the, the, you know, uh, child rearing is is uh, is shared by by the community, in, including during um, uh, the operation of, uh, of child care facilities. So we need to uh, look closely at the gap between uh, you know the promise and the delivery. Um, Biden's cabinet is no exception. It will be um, maybe um, full of uh, token representatives of. Uh, uh, you know, um, marginalized or oppressed sectors of society, but it will not be replete with policies that reduce um, war expenditures and the military, uh, that provide housing, that provide the needs of working people, particularly in this pandemic. Um, if, if governments were really interested in uh, combating racism, they would defund the police and they would double the wages of frontline workers. And I'm talking about those in long-term care centers. I'm talking about those who uh, you know um, uh, receive uh, uh, food deliveries in giant warehouses, and who are driving the trucks that move um, important um, food stuff and other materials from place to place. 
Uh, these are the people that should be most highly rewarded and taking the, the biggest risks in this very dangerous time. Um, someone asked about um, the, the capitalists and uh, they're very uh, class conscious. They buy politicians. Well, they do, they do better than that, actually. They don't just buy politicians. They educate, they recruit the future capitalist politicians by establishing a whole range of institutions. And I'm not talking solely about private schools, although that plays an important role. Um, I'm not talking about the exclusive um, uh, uh, you know, uh, golf clubs and recreational facilities where they hone the talents of their uh, up and coming uh, progeny uh, politicians, but, but uh, the political parties that they foster. Uh, um, you know, in Canada, there's, there's a, a tale that, you know, municipal politics is, uh, is um, uh, non-political. Um, it's, 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 it's close to the people and therefore there should be no political parties. But, but the, the, the city councils across the country are just full of uh, bourgeois politicians in training. The school boards and city councils um, populated by so-called independent politicians are really populated by uh, the, um, the, the folks that uh, aspire to be and are encouraged to be uh, the, uh, the leaders of the, uh, the corporate state in the future. So uh, we need to expose that by running uh, candidates that reflect uh, a worker's agenda. Uh, and that's one thing, for example, on a very small scale, Socialist Action is doing currently in Scarborough Agent Court, where there's a by-election in Ward 22 in Northeast Toronto, where we're running Corey David as a candidate in the municipal election to show that, the, that there is a socialist alternative to overcrowded buses and uh, dangerous workplaces and um, uh, poorly treated frontline workers, that the priorities are completely out of whack and it'll take socialists fighting for a workers' agenda to uh, to set that uh, to set that right. Um, there was a question about contradictions in the system, and I didn't I, I first didn't know what was was meant by JP, but uh, let me take a crack at it. The biggest con one of the biggest contradictions, and Marx analyzed this, uh, you know, 160 years ago, is the contradiction between the character of production and the ownership of the means of production. Production in capitalist society is basically social in character, uh, but private ownership is a fetter on, uh, the, uh, on the organization of production, especially on its organization to meet human needs in harmony with nature. So let me give an example. Um, do you think anyone can build a car by herself or himself? It, it, it's virtually impossible, even if you had all the parts, even if you didn't rely on industry to produce those parts. Um, but you, you can't produce a fleet of cars. You can't produce a, a fleet of, of buses or streetcars or, or you know, green uh, transportation alternatives by oneself. The, the, you have to bring together materials and labor in a concerted way, according to a plan, to, to develop uh, um, you know, those um, means of transportation, means of communication, and for that matter, food to feed millions. That's social production. But private ownership is what characterizes the commanding heights of the economy, the production of, 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 the, of the vast array of things that humanity needs, uh, from homes to transportation to um, agricultural implements um, and a healthcare system. Um, but uh, the, the goal of meeting human needs through democratically organized social production is thwarted by uh, the, the private ownership. That is the competition between capitalists to maximize profit, even if it means producing shoddy materials or dangerous materials or fostering dangerous, work, dangerous working conditions. If you replace private ownership with public ownership and democratic control, you can bring social production directly into harmony with humanity's needs and with uh, and with nature, and this goes directly to the question of how to limit exploitation of the environment. You know, and ha like Hadass, who I think wisely two minutes backed away from. <laughs> thank you, who wisely backed away from the question of you know uh, whether we need to a degrowth society. We certainly uh, need to end the production of useless things, wasteful things, and we need to end the practice of industry uh, externalizing its waste into the environment to say that, well, the, you know, 
polluting a river, that's no big deal. I mean, it's got to go somewhere and um, nobody owns it. So um, let it go there. But, you know, the, the price for that is paid by every one of us and future generations. So how do we take, how do we limit exploitation of the environment? Well, we need to take profit out of the equation. We need to rely on science, science detached from the profit system and that, that, that relies on uh, evidence uh, and that tells us when to produce certain things and when to curtail the production of things that, that, uh, that threaten uh, civilization and the environment. We need a green energy system and that's going to require uh, um, seizing the assets and the control of the energy giants, reinvesting their plundered billions into uh, systems which are in harmony with nature. Uh, and, 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 and that means um, uh, carbon neutral or uh, you know, uh, sustainable energy um, uh, uh, systems. Uh, taking the profit out of the equation in terms of the environment is something that we can uh, learn from indigenous people who are in the vanguard of defense of the environment. Uh, but, but you have to ask, why do, why do you find often that indigenous people's organizations are in the forefront of those fighting pipelines and fighting other destructive uh, measures uh, a, a, that are harmful to the environment? Well, it's because th their legacy, the, 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 the culture and the um, legacy that they seek to preserve, in many cases, not all, is common ownership of, of, of land and resources uh, on contact. Uh, indigenous people in this hemisphere uh, were, for the most part, um, living in societies that were not characterized by ownership. They were characterized by common ownership, and that's why they're in conflict with the energy giants, with the big pipeline makers, with with the uh, with, with big oil and big gas. So uh, they're in conflict, and humanity really is in conflict with capitalism. We can't we can't go back to uh, a, um, an earlier mode of production, but we can go forward to one in which. Uh, a profit is subordinate to um, uh, that which is good for people and the environment. Thank you. Thank you, Barry. Okay, go back to our producer for our last two questions. All right. So our first question comes from uh, Betty Jane Anti uh, Antena Vis Vicious, and I'm just going to truncate it because it was in three parts, but I'll just do the first. Uh, the last two. The environment is already under so much pressure. Pandemics a product of people encroaching on a limited environment. Animals lose out. Can we eat our computers? So I think she's referring to a lack of, uh, or the future potential for a lack of uh, resources. And Abby C asks, capitalism has led to the belief that success is tied to riches. Will socialism redefine what success means to us? How will success or achievement be defined under socialism versus under capitalism? Okay, so we're going to go back to our panelists. We'll go to Adas first and then Barry, and you have up to six minutes, and that includes your, your wrap-up. Adas? Okay, Thank you. Um, well, first of all, thanks to everyone um, for participating for the really good questions. Um, you know, I think it's it's really useful and really critical that we have uh, more, as, as many discussions of these questions as possible. Obviously this isn't what is talked about in the mainstream media and in our public schools. Um, and so we need to create our own kind of forums uh, where we can discuss amongst ourselves these kind of questions. Um, you know, I think in terms of uh, success under capitalism and success under socialism, you know, it's it's. I think it's hard to imagine, given that we have lived our entire lives seeped in, you know, capitalist ideology. The way that Marx talked about it was, he said, the ruling ideas of any society are the ideas of the ruling class, right? The people that have control over the media, over the schools, um, over you know all the messages that we get day in and day out. And so we're just seeped in this stuff. It's the air that we breathe and it's hard to imagine you know, what we may be without those things. Um, capitalism encourages this idea that, you know, um, that yeah, how, how wealthy you are determines your, your worth. Um, and it's it's useful as a as a propaganda tool because 
it makes it seem like, you know, Jeff Bezos just has the right to, you know, hundreds of billions of dollars. Um, and he just came up with these, you know, brilliant ideas and therefore he has the right to it. Um, but it also it encourages um, this idea that if we're not working, if we're not productive, if we're not an effective, you know, part of our society, um, then, and that means money making, then we're worthless. I mean, if you think about, I'm, I'm a parent of a four-year-old um, and, um, you know, I don't have, I don't have money to, to afford to not work. Um, but, you know, parenting is just not considered work because it doesn't produce profit. Actually, parenting for anyone who's a parent knows this is true is one of the hardest jobs that you could have. It's a 24 seven job and um, it requires, I'm not, you know, I won't get into it because I could go on and on about how much it requires. Um, it's an incredibly difficult job. Um, it, it's, but it's completely, um, you know, cons it's considered you're doing nothing. I mean, you know, what's a stay at home mom? It's, she's, you know, she's not, she's not worth um, anything. So, you know, capitalism, um, it de depends on us kind of buying into this idea that our, our worth is tied into what we produce for the system. Um, and I think in a different kind of society, you could imagine that, you know, our worth would be determined by the relationships that we have, that would be determined by the things that we do together, that would be determined by our contribution to the greater good. You know, that I, I imagine that the scientists that have been working uh, day and night for months to come up, you know, to help to develop these vaccines um, probably feel pretty good <laughs> about being able to do that. And it's not because you know, I because Pfizer can make a profits that makes them feel good about that, but that we do have you know a human impulse to actually contribute to the greater good, and I think um, you know that um, you know I'll, I'll I'll end with that because I think you know that's the vision of a different kind of society where if we were not tied to uh, the profit motive as being um, the key uh, driver for. Uh, every piece of decision making that wasn't the key driver of our um, personal and collective uh, well-being, um, that we could imagine a, a very different kind of society that's actually based on camaraderie, on human need, and our relationships with each other. Um, and I think that, you know, that's a very different kind of society than the one that we currently live in. And I think it's very much worth uh, fighting for. Thank you, Hadass. Barry, six minutes. Yeah, that was wonderful. Hard, hard to follow, Hadass. Um, I'm going to take up a question that was asked earlier and one that was just asked now. So Roy Jones, Roy Jones asked the question about communism and free speech, and why does communism have a bad rap? Well, it has a bad rap because of the isolation of the first world, uh, the first worker state in the history of the world. The Russian Revolution and the Bolshevik Party were very uh, democratic. Uh, uh, organizations um, um, at the at the inception of the Russian Revolution, there was uh, an explosion of art and creativity and and freedom from the different language groups and the nationalities in the Tsarist Empire were offered self determination. Uh, they, they decided in, to ally with the Soviet power because they knew that the uh, the white generals would uh, reduce them to uh, to misery and uh, and feudal uh, repression. Uh, that uh, that they had known for centuries. So uh, what happened to the workers and farmers councils, the Soviets, where there was political pluralism, where there was um, uh, debate uh, and vigorous uh, disagreement? Well, what happened to the Russian Revolution was imperialist circ circlement, wars of intervention uh, that created uh, serious shortages, uh, even starvation in the countryside. Um, and in order to, um, as Trotsky says in his um, um, uh, the, the revolution betrayed, you know, when, when there are shortages, you need someone to maintain order in the line, in the queue to get the, sh the, the, the scarce uh, necessities of life. And you have to pay the people keeping the queue in, in order a little bit, a little bit more than the others. 
uh, and therein lies the, 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 uh, the, the seeds of bureaucratic degeneration, the rise of a pri privileged bureaucracy, not only in the lineup outside the food store, but in the, the whole system of government. Um, that bureaucracy was crystallized and identified uh, by its re main representative, Joseph Stalin. Not only did that decimate the, uh, the, the democracy uh, in the world's uh, were first worker state, but it subordinated all of the parties around the world that had identified with the Russian Revolution. Uh, and, and the Comintern became a command structure where the leaders of uh, parties uh, far from the Soviet Union were dictated by uh, the Stalinist bureaucrats uh, in, the, in the Kremlin. Um, the decimation of the workers' uh, vanguard, the curtailing of proletarian democracy, the outlaw of tendencies and factions, this was not <coughs> preordained. It was not in the DNA of the makers of the Russian Revolution. It was a product of the isolation of the Russian Revolution, the failure of the German Revolution. Had Germany gone socialist and it came close to doing so in 1919, 1921, and 1923, we'd be living in a world uh, free of war, exploitation, racism, and sexism today. But it didn't work out that way, and the imperialists got their act together. They isolated Russia. Russia eventually, under Stalinist rule, lost the arms race, uh, and capitalism was, was restored. Um, th that is not the necessary outcome. And when revolution occurs in the advanced capitalist countries, they'll be able to conquer uh, hunger and want and scarcity and deliver um, um, uh, the means of production necessary to raise up uh, the peoples of the world who have been suffering colonial exploitation for so, so, so very long. Um, someone asked about uh, uh, success being in, e equated with riches. Well, what is the purpose of life? I mean, th this is an important philosophical question. Is, is it simply a matter of uh, accumulation of wealth is, is that the measure of, uh, of one's humanity? Is that the measure of our potential? Is, 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 is by personal enrichment and accumulation uh, the way to, well, it's certainly not the way to overcome the contradictions, the boom bust cycle of capitalist production, uh, poverty and exploitation, it certainly won't help us reach the stars. But how will we um, uh, live in harmony with nature and, and utilize the conquest of science to make things better and to enable us to explore ever farther? Well, I'm, 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 I'm a Trekkie. I like Star Trek, and I refer to an episode where um, Captain Picard and the, uh, and, 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 and the Enterprise uh, came upon people who were in stasis for a long time. They, when they awoke, uh, these were businessmen from uh, 21st century Earth, and they, they said, well, what are we to do now? Uh, we, we had companies. We had investments. Uh, you don't seem to have any of those things. What is, what is your purpose? What shall we do? And, and, and Picard looked at them quizzically and he said, well, you know, there, there's more to life than that. You should try to improve yourself. And that's what socialism will be all about, improving ourselves, getting rid of the, uh, the, the, the trade wars and the hot wars and, 30 seconds. The, and the misery that we associate with uh, contemporary capitalism, including in this uh, uh, wrenching period of pandemic to rid the world of exploitation, to have a flourishing socialist democracy, to see art reach heights undreamed of, and to, and to explore the, the world and the universe. And that, that will be the way we can improve ourselves. We deserve better than what we have now, and to achieve it, we'll need a socialist revolution and a revolutionary socialist party to lead humanity towards the conquest of all that is evil, cleansing the world of exploitation forever and, and, and building a future of which we can be proud, a future that we deserve. Thank you very much. Thank you. Special thanks to Adas and Barry and to our producer, Kurt Young in Mississauga and to everyone who participated in tonight's uh, conversation. Please consider buying a subscription to Socialist Action Newspapers, only $27 for one year delivered to your door. To fill out the form, just visit our website at www.socialistaction.ca. If you would like to talk to us about SA, write to Socialist Action Canada at gmail.com or just give us a call at 647-986-1917. Also, as mentioned before, Earlier in the program, Socialist Action is running a candidate, Corey David, in the Toronto Ward 22 by-election. The vote takes place on January the 15th. Your support in any form is appreciated. 
Our next webcast, next, next Socialist Action webcast, will be hosted by our Montreal branch on Tuesday, December the 22nd at 7 p.m. It's titled Capitalism versus Life on Earth. It features Ian Angus, editor of the website Climate and Capitalism. For details, you can go to www.socialistaction.ca. Then, SA will take a break for the holidays and come January the 14th, that's January the 14th, 7 p.m. Eastern Time, we will be back uh, from our webcast uh, based in Toronto. So in the meantime, please stay safe, stay well, and be active. Bye for now.